camera right. that we had Thank to activate. You. Okay. Oh. Okay, great. So, everyone, this is Jamie Carrero. Hi, Jamie. Hi. <laughs> Hello, future Hi. of the world. <laughs> And uh, Jamie is currently the Director of Innovation at uh, Goodby, Silverstein, and Partners at their satellite office in New York. It's a major agency that's primarily through, uh, or their main office is in San Francisco, and they've just opened this new office in New York. It's small. They've got some construction going on out there. And, uh, but he's here to talk about how advertising engages with art. So. He and I were in college together making movies, like real avant-garde silly stuff. I decided I wasn't going to show them Fat Elvis, but I thought about yeah, it. Um, <laughs> and he's advanced way better from those days. But uh, So we were making videos and making art and talking about art. And one time we made this joke, you know, Cherise, one day uh, Jamie said, I'm going to make the culture and the marketing and you're going to talk about it and it's going to be awesome. And here we are 10 years later, and this is actually what's happening. So uh, I respect him as an artist. I think he's amazing, and it's unbelievable that he has been able to take off in marketing and kind of change the game. So uh, I have a couple questions, and I'm going to encourage him just to tell us about his experience, and then we'll field some questions from you guys. So Jamie, to start off, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Uh, yeah, so I work at an advertising agency, and if, if you know, people make jokes about comparisons to Mad Men, but if you're a fan of that show at all, it's not really that bad of a uh, example of what it's like to be in advertising. Essentially, you have a client, they have some business need, and you have to try and accomplish that business need through communication, through either uh, educating people about their brand or con correcting a misconception or you know, telling a new story entirely. Usually this is done through traditional media, and we would ca categorize that uh, as everything that's television, print, um, and then out of home, which is sort of billboards and uh, bus stations and subways and things like that. That's what the, the real like meat and potatoes of advertising has been for decades, uh, for almost as long as it's existed, you know, starting with things like sign painting in the 20s all the way up to big Super Bowl spots. Now, what I do is a category that's outside of that, essentially doing things that um, are meant to gather their own attention. Typically, uh, in traditional advertising, you make a media buy, and that means that you've bought, you know, say, 30 seconds of time during the Super Bowl. There's a set number of people that are guaranteed to see that, and it's the same across most advertising. If you buy the front page of a newspaper, if you buy a billboard in Times Square, there's people whose job it is to set a value for that, tell you how many people are likely to see it, and when you make that purchase, you're guaranteed that that's how many impressions that you're, you're going to get. And so this is very safe, it's very traditional, and this is what a lot of people like to do. Uh, in my category of work, it's things that have to gather their own attention. Like you make a video, or you do a stunt, or you do something where people will be interested enough to seek it out. And frequently, that involves no promotion. Um, for example, something we did a couple years ago for Delta, is we wanted more people to think of, to download their app, which let you track your bag. That when you check your bag into the bag check, you could see where it goes every time it gets checked in. So rather than put out a billboard or come up with a TV spot or something to just push this on people, we decided let's make a piece of content that will gather attention. So we rigged a bag with cameras pointed in every direction, and then we just checked it into the bag system and sent it through the bag check at several airports and put that on YouTube as a video. We didn't really put any promotion out there. We just said, like, here's a press release. We've done this fun stunt. Check it out. What happens is the traditional media and blogs and Facebook and everybody picks it up, um, and we got a million views within a week and a half. And so Delta saw their downloads go up. All the marketing goals are achieved. But it's a different equation, because what you have to do is, is attract attention from people when there's no guarantee. So a lot of what I do day-to-day uh, -day is trying to convince a client to take a little bit of a risk on something that we think is cool enough to get a lot of attention. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what my job is, is to expand the creative uh, fields that we work in as an advertising agency outside of that traditional realm into things that are much more like, you know, just attention getting on their own. Awesome. Uh, can you talk about some of the other projects that you have um, worked on that are in this arena as well? Yeah, um, one for ESPN that was kind of fun is that uh, in San Francisco, 
there's a baseball stadium for the Giants, and it's right on the water. And so there's this this cove called McCovey Cove. And what happens is that when people hit home runs or foul balls, they fall in the water. So a lot of people show up in kayaks, these super fans, and they just paddle around all day during the game and try and catch the home run balls that fall in the water. So ESPN wanted to do some kind of big Cinco de Mayo splash and you know and get attention for their uh, Sunday night baseball stuff. So we built a kayak that was a hot dog stand. It had an umbrella and kept a bunch of hot dogs in it, and we just had a guy paddle around all day and give hot dogs to the people who were there waiting to catch the balls. And so again, this is done with no promotion. It just takes off on Twitter and Instagram, and then they can cut to it on air, and it's kind of like something to get fans excited without being too much about your brand. Because we didn't say, like, oh, hey, you know, watch ESPN. We didn't say anything other than a little logo on the kayak that says ESPN, and then we gather all this attention by doing something, in this case, kind of stupid, but kind of, you know, funny and interesting. Uh, on a side note, I'd like to throw out a key term. It's called persuasion knowledge, right? So when we know that we're being persuaded, we have a psychological reaction, right? We may turn off to whatever the message is. But in these little branding fascination, you know, branding strategies, the persuasion becomes less valuable, right? It's like, oh, there's a hot dog stand hanging out. Of course it's branded with ESPN, right? When I'm watching ESPN, everything makes sense that it manages to get through that persuasion knowledge blockage that um, we, that persuasion knowledge wall that we erect by uh, engaging in a more dynamic relationship with the brand. Yeah, and it also gets into the, the debate that we have in, in the industry of ads versus content. You know, what is an ad and what is content? Because, you know, a simple way to explain it is ads are something people don't like and content is something that people seek out and pay money for. Uh, but there's a gray area in between where you have branded content, where it's like, okay, well, there's a little bit of advertising in there and a little bit of content. But what I try and do is push it all the way into the content category so that all I'm asking of people is give me a little bit of your attention and I'll show you something interesting. And the marketing message almost disappears completely. So one of the terms that I mentioned in the email that I sent you was the currency of attention, right? So we talk a lot about the currency of eyeballs or impressions, how many people see your ad, but that doesn't mean anything anymore, right? Because seeing something is not the same as engaging with it. We want their attention. We want to pull them in. We want them to share it with their friends, right? And become a point of conversation, not just a pair of eyeballs to consume. Yeah, and that's, um, you know, something, a way I like to talk about it is that the, the currency of media for decades has been just currency, just money. Like if you want to get eyeballs, you just pay somebody money and because we have these single pipes like television or billboard, you just put it down the pipe and people will see it. Uh, in an on-demand culture, of course fueled mostly by the internet and then all the peripheral products that are sort of fueled by that kind of networked culture, anybody can seek out things at any time and you have sort of a, a fine, as a person, as a consumer of media, you have a set amount of attention you're willing to give. Let's say you have four hours of free time on a given day. You're going to choose how to spend that. That's your currency. It's your attention. That's the valuable thing that you have that you can give to a piece of content. So when you see a YouTube video and it says like, oh hey, here's somebody wrestling an alligator and it says five minutes. In your mind what happens is you think, am I willing to pay five minutes of my attention to see this stupid video? And the answer is probably no, not at five minutes. But you might pay a 30 second price, you know, a 30 second attention price to see that video. So what I try and do uh, is balance the amount of attention that I'm asking from somebody with the amount of content that I'm giving them. And typically an a good way to define an ad is you're asking for a large amount of attention for very, very little content. And it only really works when you have a captive audience, people who are watching an hour long of television, you know they're sitting there, they're locked in the chair, they're going to watch it. But as soon as you move into a place where you're asking people to pay that attention and they have a choice, you have to make a much different uh, kind of content. So we'll take a pause here. Are there any questions? Does anybody have anything that they would like to uh, pose to Jamie? Matt. And let me move this so you can see Matt. Uh. Wait, oh wait, no, Matt's, Matt, Matt, Matt is in that direction. Okay. Yeah, there he is. Hopefully you can hear him. If not, I'll repeat the question. Okay. What do you focus on or think about when you're trying to build an advertisement when you already know you're taking that risk? Like, what is what goals do you set for yourself for building it? Did you hear that? Uh, no, you should repeat it to me. Okay. So he said, uh, what goals? Or do you want to come up here and ask it out loud? Sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. 
I don't know what that was. Um, that was. That was me. Sorry, I have okay. my email thing going. If you have, if you have any questions, I encourage you to write them down. That way, we can come up and ask them specifically. So here's Matt. There's you. No, there's hey, Matt. Hello. Hi. By the way. Um, Sorry. He said nice glasses. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, what do you focus on or think about when you're building an advertisement when you already know you're taking that risk? And are you the one that's pursuing the people in the companies, or are they coming to you? Oh. Um, yeah, kind of two, two big categories of, of question there. Uh, in terms of goals, and by risk you mean that same risk where it's like, hey, we're going to go after something that has to earn its own eyeballs, right? Like that's the yes. thing you mean by risk. Yeah. So well, one of the first things we think about, and this comes in very, very early in the discussions, is what's, uh, what's the headline? Like what's the one-line thing that will probably manifest as a link either on a blog or an RSS feed or somewhere, some tweet or something, that's going to draw people in? does our project that we want to do produce a headline that's going to catch people? So, for instance, uh, to pick that Delta example again, if you, if you saw a link and it says, where does your bag go when you check it into the bag check? Most people think, like, oh, hey, that's a good headline. I'm curious about that. I want to do that. I'm interested in that. A really great example of a headline project is the Tupac hologram. Like, if you see a headline that says, Tupac resurrected as a hologram, like, everyone, it doesn't matter if you're a music fan, you're going to click on that because that's a fantastic headline. So um, that's one of the primary things, and a lot of a lot of projects don't have that. That you might find something that's a really great experience for people. That when they encounter it, it's fantastic. It's some kind of game or an awful thing, but you just don't have a way to say it in one line. And sometimes that will kill a project right away. The other thing that we focus on in in taking these risks is: Am I asking anything of the audience? Do I want them to do something, to put a lot of effort in? Because frequently you want to do some kind of contest or an interactive experience where they have to learn how to play a game. Uh, but you, you have to set that threshold really low because, again, you're asking for people's time. So if you have something that's a really great experience and would be fantastic, but there's too big of an initial hurdle to get people involved, it's probably not going to make uh, good marketing. It might make a really good product. You know, like That might be a perfect idea for something that is not... Uh, that doesn't carry a marketing message. but it, So that's something else we think about. And then I guess the last thing it, in terms of broad categories, and this one is, these aren't really in order, it's just like these are the things that are important, is what is what is this brand? Like what are they really holistically? What is the spirit of the brand, the nature of what they do? And does this project fit their identity? Because what you don't want to do is have, uh, you know, we talk about brands becoming kind of the Medici's, the sponsors of art, the patrons of the art who make certain projects possible. If the brand is out of alignment with the artwork that you create, it hurts in both directions. You know, like if, you know, if, uh, what's a good example? If NBC hired Banksy, that would be a bad choice for everybody because NBC doesn't have the cool points to, legitim you know, to legitimately use somebody like Banksy, and Banksy would ruin his reputation by being so corporate. So you have to, like, as cool as your project might be, if it doesn't fit the personality of the brand, you also can't do it. For, you know, for that reason. So, uh, just to put it out there, you know, who might hire Banksy? I don't know if you guys have ever seen Banksy on a corporate front, but the only one I can think of was uh, when he did the opening for The Simpsons. Do you remember yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, totally. And that was a big thing because Simpsons, even though they are a 25-year-old program on a major network, <laughs> still have that cool factor, still have that unique avant-garde <laughs> special factor where it fits together. Absolutely, and even though they're now very accepted and sort of non-threatening, the early days of The Simpsons, you know, people were banning that show. People were saying, your kids can't watch it, it's destroying culture, it's terrible. So that edge is still in that brand, and then Banksy, I think it's important that the work he actually did, then made fun of the show. I think the intro included sweatshop animators in Korea slaving under you know, a whip, literally, was how he commented on the show. So he maintained his brand, The Simpsons maintained theirs, and they could kind of share that way. Um, oh, the other thing, the other half of your question is, do we go after people or do they come after us? Uh, there's kind of, I mean, there's two relationships you can have, and that's speaking very, very broadly. There are obviously more, but there are two broad relationships you can have with a brand. You can be what's called their agency of record, which means that almost all the time you're the default agency for whatever their advertising needs are. You set the strategy for their brand. You set, like, multi-year plans sometimes. It's a very close partnership at, at best, you hope it is. And then there's things that are just one-off projects, you know, and, and some uh, companies, well, pretty much any large company, has more than one agency because there's so much work that needs to be done. Like somebody like Coca-Cola or Google, 
could have 7, 10, even 15 different ad agencies working for them at any given time. So if you're not the agency of record, you might get a one-off project. It's like, hey, we know that you as an agency are really good at live events. We have a rock concert. Can you do just that one live event? And sometimes those are the really, really cool opportunities. Because if you're the agency of record, you obviously have to do their banner ads and their kind of like mundane radio stuff and whatever. But if you can do those one-off things, sometimes they call you in just to do something cool for a high budget and then get out. Um, but in terms of clients, yeah, sometimes you pitch new business by just deciding you like a company and putting together a presentation and just calling them, like cold calls and things like that. Although there's also a lengthy process of consultants so that when a large company wants a new agency, there's a formal process of kind of headhunting for agencies. Any other questions? Catherine. Catherine, I might have to ask you to come up here. And you mind? Is that cool? So this is Catherine. Hello. So you kind of already talked about the adaptation of advertising and marketing and kind of this new technological era. But we are coming up on the baby boomers who might not be as technologically savvy. So how do you market? to this age group, do you market to this age group? That's kind of my question. Yeah, well, no, it's a good question. And that's, it, it really, um, I guess I'll answer it broadly and then, and then specifically. Um, the broad answer is that you, a huge part of what we do is understanding the audience. Um, that's, I mean, there are certain people who, if you wanted to boil down their job in an ad agency, it's just understand your audience. You know, this, everything from strategists to account people to, you know, whoever. It's just uh, everything about how you communicate has to do with what your target is. So to answer your question more specifically, do we target baby boomers? It depends on the client. You know, if I'm selling Axe body spray, which thankfully I haven't had to do yet, um, then I'm not going to target someone who's 60 years old. It doesn't make sense. It's not who buys that product. Um, but if I if I were, so let's say there is a product that has an older demographic. I think a, a friend of mine who works on Progresso was telling me that Progresso Soups is like a 50 plus years old demo. Um, <laughs> In terms, of, uh, in terms of selling them through some kind of technology, it comes back to uh, how can we make it simple? How can we make that technology disappear? Um, a great example is grandmothers using iPads. Like the iPad is a supercomputer with a high-res screen, with Wi-Fi connectivity, with all this crazy stuff. But because it's so simple, a grandmother can use it. I mean, I've even seen videos of a frog playing a game where you have to catch flies because it, it understands to lick the screen where the thing goes. So I guess my answer is, if you're going to use technology for an audience that is not fluent, then you have to make technology that doesn't require fluency. Um, the great thing is you can do that. Like a good, a well-designed interface has no manual. You know, for instance, I mean, you can you can point to Apple over and over again for these principles. But like, there's no. You buy an iPhone, you don't really get a manual. You don't open the manual and search through things. You just start using it. It invites you to use it. Um, so yeah, in terms of using, I, I mean, the other answer though really is that so much of what we do is about engaging with culture at its at its front edge, at like trying to be relevant all the time that if people are aging out of certain technologies, they are, to a certain extent, aging out of the demographic that we're interested in talking to. The vast majority of products, even though it varies wildly, the vast majority of products are sold to people between 18 and 40. Like That's the age group of people who make the decisions about your culture, about your products, about all these kinds of things. Uh, unless you're talking about insurance or mortgages or, or you know bank products or things like that, it's going to be that core middle. And people who are 18 to 40 know how to use technology and want to see you existing in their technology. Does that kind of answer what we're asking? Yes, yeah, we're getting, we're getting some nods. Uh, there is one thing I wanted to ask you um, briefly. So a conversation, I think it was Cole who brought it up, was talking about um, avoidant interactivity, which is a phrase I'm working on coining. Don't worry about it. But um, actually interacting to avoid out of a commercial. And so you have that five minute opportunity, or five second opportunity, and this is kind of related to what you were talking about, about tweets and headlines. Uh, that five second opportunity to get people unless they click out and go to their program. And actually, that's a conversation that, when you said that, that's what made me want to bring Jamie into class, because he and I had that conversation about six months ago. Uh, how do you create content that exists in a five second environment? And I was wondering, Jimmy, if you had anything you wanted to expand on that or how you at Wyden and Kennedy, GSP, and your general experiences um, have managed to 
get through that um, avoidant interaction that people have. Yeah, well, I mean, if I can, you know, um, if I can just momentarily really shit on an ad product to, to illustrate a point, I think probably the worst thing that you could do, and, you know, there are spam-style arguments for why people do this. Like, that's, that's a good thing to think about, by the way, is, like, spam still exists because spam works. And I mean spam both as email spam, but spam anywhere. Like, it works. If you want to use a shotgun and shoot a million pellets out, you're going to hit something. Somebody's going to respond. But one thing that is a really good example of this click away thing is the pre-roll YouTube ads where it starts playing the ad, and I'm sure you've seen it in the corner, there's this little box that says click to skip the ad. And it's a countdown. It makes you watch five seconds of the ad and then skip the ad. There are two major problems with this. The first one just being, okay, so you've outright admitted that the thing that you're making is so bad, so undesirable, that you're letting people actively pass it by. So already you're taking this defensive stance of like, I don't have shit. But also, almost every advertiser forgets to put their message or their logo or anything enticing in those first five seconds. They create content that's meant to be watched in 30 seconds. So you get this, like, you know, dramatic flowing shot of a skyline somewhere with music playing. And then by the time that people have reached out to click away, you've expressed nothing. So that's, uh, in terms of, like, what not to do, that's something I see all the time that drives me crazy, is people making these massive purchases of media buys where you know that you're just annoying people. Um, so that's one side. So the positive side of how do we get past this is it's sort of what I was saying before is make sure your headline is good enough, make sure it's there. But the key thing, the, the sort of weird thing about it is don't make an ad. I think the future of advertising is to make things that are not ads. And again, that's ads defined as a message delivered to a captive audience that they would not choose to receive. And that's some, I mean, that, that's, that's something that you can kind of take away is that as a communicator, try not to make messages that people don't want to receive because we are now moving into a phase where people have choice about what media they're going to consume. So if you're making things that, that people only consume if they're forced to, then you're limiting your lifespan as a, as a marketer. Does anybody else have any other questions? Any other thoughts or conversations? Mendisa. Here is Mendisa. Uh, why don't you say your name out loud? Mendisa. Can you hear her? Uh, slightly, yeah. Uh, would you Go for start? It. Yeah, come on up. So, um, how do you balance, like, not, I know some people would like, like, with the hot dog thing, they see that, they're like, oh, that's cool, and then other people would look, and they'll see the ESPN logo and be like, oh, well, this was just an ad, so forget this, I'm upset, or whatever. So how do you sort of balance being sneaky and subliminal as opposed to just, like, showing people something interesting and then hoping they would, like, tune in? Yeah, yeah, I, that's, it's a tremendous question because, like, it's a tremendously important question because if you do that wrong, again, not only do you not help your client, you actively hurt them. And, and what you're describing, um, you can't avoid it completely, even with that Delta video. We have a lot of, you know, most people on YouTube left nice comments, but you know how YouTube is, there's always going to be some hate. And there's a long list of comments like, oh, this is fake, this isn't really how it works, they're only doing this to get us, you know, oh, it's an ad because it has a logo. There will always be people who outright reject advertising anywhere they see it, that as soon as they see that logo, they'll just say no. And, and, and to some extent, these people are not going to be reachable. It's too skeptical. But the way that you solve this is be benevolent. Be altruistic. Be focused on giving people something, and then uh, you won't get as much backlash. And in terms of, I think you mentioned subliminal or sneaky in there, uh, that's something that uh, you're usually best served to not do, is that uh, something that has happened, particularly, again, with like the, you can talk endlessly about the effects of the internet, but I think one of the biggest ones is that it has drawn the curtain back from a whole bunch of things that happen in media. People are much more skeptical. People are much more used to the idea that you could Google something or look on Snopes or figure out if something is real. So you don't really want to trick people. With the ESPN kayak project, we wanted everybody to know that it was ESPN. And, and I don't mean that just from the point of view of trying to promote them. We didn't want to sneak around like it wasn't us. We wanted people to know that that's what was happening because that honesty is something that people are looking for. And then it also just speaks, again, to know your audience. Make sure that what you're doing makes so much sense that when they see that brand, they don't say, oh, shit, it's ESPN. I don't want to pay attention. They say, oh, it's ESPN. That makes total sense. That makes me like ESPN. That means ESPN understands me. 
So it, it, it just comes down to targeting to avoid uh, as much of that backlash as you can. So uh, we're coming to the last uh, three minutes. Don't pack up because then we'll have some camera issues. Uh, we're coming to the last three minutes or so, um, and there are two questions that I'd like to ask you. We had a lengthy discussion in class about what is media. And I was wondering, you know, as someone coming out of marketing and advertising, how would you define media? And have you ever actually tried to do that before? Oh, uh, that's no, I don't know that I've tried to define it super broadly. Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind, this isn't the definition of media, but the first thing that comes to mind to illustrate what media has become is that Google is a media company. I think we, we talked about this the other day when we were on the phone. That's what they are primarily. You could think, oh, they do search, they do maps, they do email, they... No, Google is a media company. They make their money by selling advertising space for people to make ads. Everything from AdWords to banners to the YouTube masthead to everything. That is what they're in the business of doing. Um, a principle that Google works on, um, and that I guess this could be a different way of thinking of media. Um, everything that you use on Google is probably free, you know, unless you're a business that wants like the business level email. You probably, I'm sure everyone sitting here, you don't pay Google any money. Uh, but a great way to look at it is if you aren't paying for the product, you are the product. I got the point to my, you are the product. Um, because that means that someone is providing you with a service in order to gain your attention, in order to sell that attention to somebody else. This is exactly what Gmail is. Gmail is a way to create media space, that media being your eyeballs looking at the screen, and then deliver ads to it. You know, you have that little bar um, across the top. It's just one line of text and there's a text ad, and it's contextualized, it's tracked, it's based on everything you do online. That is how they make money off of Gmail. So if I was going to define media in the modern context, I'd say that media is the opportunity for somebody to see something, however you generate that. It can be someone in the middle of Times Square lighting themselves on fire, or it can be a television ad. But media is just anywhere where people are looking at a thing, and you have the opportunity to insert your message into their attention stream. That, that's an excellent definition. Thank you. Um, so we're going to wrap up. Is there anything else you'd like to share or anything? These are all budding media makers. They are in their first semester at Newhouse, one of the top media schools in the country. Do you have any words of advice that you'd like to share in the last minute or so? Yeah, there were two things. One, um, you were telling me the other night that uh, everybody has to learn a skill that you can't just major in theory. You have to actually study to get a practical skill that you can apply. I just want to emphasize that that's tremendously important because as media makers across a wide variety of industries, no one is really going to care about your opinion when you start, but they're going to care about your, your skills that can pay the bills. So if you become a really good editor or you're a good gaffer or you're, you know, whatever, any number of a, a, a long list of production skills, that's how you're going to be able to get in the door and get paid while you build up enough credibility to be a little bit more creative in what you do. So that's the first thing. It's just that's super great. Keep on doing that. Uh, the other thing is is a realization um, that I've made that's kind of, you know, sometimes you sit up late with friends and have drinks and kind of really consider this, um, but it's a realization that sometimes art is expensive and there are things that you cannot make without a large budget. And for certain types of creative pursuits, the only way you're ever going to pay for it is to find a brand that wants to do it. You know, a really good example is like the Intel Creators Project where they'll put on stage shows at Coachella and do these massive multi-million dollar effects. There's really, you know, particularly the way the music industry works now, there's really no way that you're going to get that type of show unless you can pay for it yourself or you get a brand to do it. Um, so that's something to consider is think about that if, you know, if you do want to be a creative person and you want to do large scale works, you know, even things like movies, you have to think about is this something that I can fund on my own and if not, what kind of brand am I willing to sort of get in bed with and sell my soul to in order to make that project? Who's going to let me maintain as much creative control as possible and stay kind of out of it? Because sometimes there's just literally no way to get it done. All right. Well, thank you very, very much, Jamie. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Hi. Hi. And I really appreciate you coming out. And uh, yeah, I'll be in touch. I'll probably have you come back again next semester. Awesome. Yeah, it was fun. All right. Thank you. Bye.